this is rare to have from the University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Scotland, Professor Emeritus Larry Hurtado. Professor Dr. Hurtado has taught many students. He's responsible for a lot of the scholars in our world today in the area of Christendom, but he's also taught many others through his writings. His latest book is Destroyer of the Gods, Early Christian Distinctiveness in the Roman World. This is a gentleman who is extraordinary in his breadth of knowledge. He's got an understanding of Christianity in the first couple of centuries that is unrivaled, I believe, probably in academic uh, uh, Christianity in the world today. He has focused his attention in those early centuries for a reason, uh, or for a number of reasons, I'm sure. But among those reasons, something interesting he said to us yesterday, he said that he believes Europe is already in a post-Christian era and that America is rapidly becoming a post-Christian world. And he said, if we look at the church before Constantine, when the church was going through cyclical persecution and certainly it was not a Christian world, we see some marvelous ways that we can face the times that are in front of us and not do it with despair, but do it with hope that out of that, God brought a vibrant church that changed the world. And so it, I'm really fascinated to hear what he's got to tell us tonight about what made Christianity distinct in its Roman era and, and what it's got to say to us today. So with that, I'm going to ask you to give a warm Texas welcome to Professor Dr. Larry Hurtado. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. In the plentiful cafeteria of religious options available in the first three centuries, early Christianity stands out. This was truly a time of religious diversity and development that included the traditional Roman and Greek pantheons, of course, as well as the deities of the various other peoples and localities encompassed in the Roman Empire. Among the latter, were city gods, such as Artemis of Ephesus, deities of, uh, of such areas as Phrygia, Syria, and Egypt, and elsewhere. There were also lesser divinities of families and households, and even spirit beings thought to be linked to specific sites, such as bridges, kitchens, and even latrines. There were also new and refashioned religious movements aplenty. The title of a book on Roman-era religion captured well the situation. It was a world full of gods. So, on the one hand, early Christianity appeared as only one option among many, and only one new religious movement among others. To use another metaphor, early Christianity entered the traffic as a new movement on a very crowded and well-traveled highway of religious activity. On the other hand, early Christianity was, I contend, quite distinctive in that setting even in the diverse and pluralized religious options of the time. Indeed, for many observers then, it was objectionably different and seen as even a serious threat to Roman-era piety, to family solidarity, and to society. To appreciate early Christian distinctiveness and why it generated such negativity, it is helpful to take some further account of the religious environment first in which it appeared and developed. It is important to note that in the time in which early Christianity first appeared, by all indications, other religious activities and interests were thriving. The old notion that the pagan gods were dying off and that's the secret of Christianity is a complete fallacy. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. All the evidence indicates the opposite. The various deities of the time were in fact doing quite well. The remains of Roman era cities reflect the prominence and abundance of temples and shrines to the gods. Here you see a picture, of course, of the famous Pantheon in Rome, uh, dedicated to, as its name implies, all the deities in general, a very ecumenical kind of temple. Major portions of Roman-era cities were given to such structures, which typically were made of expensive stone. Here's another Roman-era temple from Nîmes in France. Were made of expensive stone, colorfully decorated. Unfortunately, today all the paint has washed off, and so we imagine that these temples were gray granite, but they were actually brilliantly, brightly colored, uh, as were all the statuary. And they occupied prominent and central sites 
in Roman cities. Indeed, a major percentage, in some cases, 40% of the urban, central urban area were given over to temples in the Roman period. Furthermore, throughout the period in question, the refurbishing of existing temples and the construction of new ones went on with impressive expense given to this. Outside of cities, there were shrines in the countryside in various places and small villages dedicated to various deities at sites of traditional devotion to them, as well as places where uh, more recent uh, devotees erected shrines in honor of this or that deity. Moreover, the many temples and shrines hardly sat idle. Here's an example of Minerva, goddess of the, uh, uh, one of the goddesses of the empire. Uh, here, uh, Minerva appearing as Roma, uh, the goddess of the empire. Here's the city goddess Artemis of Ephesus. The temples and shrines hardly set idle. The many uh, what are called ex voto objects found in ancient temples and shrines attest this. Here you have um, an eye uh, which is given to the god in the temple in thanks for curing uh, some eye problem. The person went into the temple, appealed to the god, please cure my eye and I promise that I'll make you a major gift. The eye gets cured, so the person responds by putting a token of their cure in the temple. And there are thousands of these things throughout uh, uh, temples and shrines throughout the ancient uh, Roman world. So the gods were answering prayers. Things were working. These were physical tokens of thanks, as I say, to deities for answering the petitions of individuals who restored health, safe delivery of a child, and many other requests. Temples and shrines also seem to have drawn many pilgrims to them, to special festivals. So here you have an, uh, a, a relief of a sacrifice. You have the the bull there who is, uh, is that showing up? Yeah. Doesn't seem to be working very well, but we'll see. Anyway, you can see the bull and the people presenting it and the musical, the guy playing the, the two-horned pipe. They drew many pilgrims for special festivals and holy days associated with the deities. These ceremonies often included street processions, such as you see here, involving choirs, musicians, priests, and other devotees who might be specially dressed for the occasion with images of the deities taken from the temples and shrines and paraded about through the streets of the city. Some temples had theaters attached to them where traditional stories and rites associated with the deity were acted out, and some had rooms in the temple complexes for devotees to meet for dinners in honor of the respective deities. Typically in that period, by the way, as you may know, when you offered an animal sacrifice, um, only a part of the animal was consumed and given to the god, part of it was given to the priest, and the main part of the animal was eaten by the devotees who cooked it up and had a nice dinner. So one of the things you have to understand that for us the word sacrifice means a costly kind of thing. In the ancient world, sacrifice means party time. Uh, you get together and you have a nice meat meal because meat was not eaten as casually as it is now. Almost all meat eaten in the ancient world was sacrificial meat. In that Roman era, religion was not only a private matter of personal petition, as exemplified by the ex voto figures, but also had very much a public and social character, um, a highly salient feature, feature of life in which the general population of a village or city could take part collectively. In fact, what we call religion was not then, as it tends to be regarded by us today, as a distinguishable, distinguishable feature or sphere of life. There's a sense in which there was no category of religion in the ancient world. For us, religion means something like religion, economics, politics, and so on, as separate spheres or, uh, or areas of life. There's no comparable word in, um, in the Roman world because they didn't think of what we call religion as being separable. It was uh, embedded and uh, interwoven through all aspects of life. The various gods and various forms of acknowledging them and devotion to them were woven inseparably into the fabric of individual social life. In many households, such as you see here, there were little deities of the household and the family would gather to express its solidarity by offering devotion to those little, these are little images just a few, just a few inches high that would be sited in a shrine in the Roman household. The meetings of professional guilds and associations typically included ritual acknowledgement of their patron deities. Some deities had special portfolios that were associated and with particular activities, of course, such as Poseidon, guardian of the sea. Others were linked with childbirth or war or almost any other activities. 
The welfare of cities was typically linked with their patron deities, such as Artemis, whom I showed to you earlier, who's, who's, um, uh, who was seen as the guardian of the city, protecting cities from plague or from earthquake or from war or such things. At the imperial level, the political system and structures rested entirely upon claims of validation by the gods. Indeed, the goddess Roma, in the image that I showed you earlier, served as the divine basis for and the expression of the empire itself. It will require some adjustment for westernized people today to grasp just how thoroughly the gods and devotion to them were pervasive and virtually inseparable from the rest of life. But it is important to do so in order to appreciate how early Christianity struck people of the time. In addition to the worship of the traditional gods, there were also various new religious movements. The traditional gods, also new religious movements, roughly contemporary with the appearance of early Christianity, and that matter deserves some brief amplification. Prominent among these were the so-called mystery cults. Uh, in some cases, they're mystery cults because we don't know much about them, not because they were particularly secretive. And the major reason was because, unlike early Christianity, they didn't write anything. Sorry, that, that was intended to show you how the gods feature in, so there you have a mosaic of a typical dining scene, uh, and um, uh, you have men and women and people serving there. Isis, uh, the Isis cult is probably the most well-known, which many will know about through the oft-read book by Lucius Apuleius, The Transformations of Lucius, also known as the Golden Ass. In her native Egypt, Isis had been a relatively secondary importance deity, but in the Roman period, she quickly acquired a considerably higher status and indeed functioned for many as, an, as, as sort of goddess of the whole empire and had an empire-wide following. The cult seems to have been particularly, but not exclusively, popular among women. Temples and attendant priests of the cult appeared in various cities, including Rome itself, and Lucius, who I mentioned earlier, portrays vividly the elaborate rituals and colorful public processions devoted to her. Another well-known mystery cult was uh, Mithras, another oriental deity, in this case deriving from ancient Persia. One of the striking things about th the cult is that Mithras was a deity favored by people who had been opponents of Rome but was adopted and adapted, and in that form became particularly favored, it appears, among the Roman army. Uh, this is uh, Mithras here shown slaying the bull, and it has various other iconographic features that are kind of standard iconographic features of uh, the Mithras cult. Here you have a picture of an actual Mithraeum, which is the space in which the Mithras cult met, tended to be underground or at least fashioned to look like it was underground. In the Mithraeum, such as you see here, the meeting place constructed to resemble a cave, fitted out with elaborate and, at least to us, cryptic symbols, his devotees met to enact rituals that we know little about today. But we do know two things. We know that the devotees were exclusively males and that they seem to have been largely drawn from the ranks of the Roman army, roughly corresponding to today's non-commissioned officers. Yet another new religious group of the time that also derived from the eastern frontier of the Roman Empire and likewise connected to Roman armies is the god Jupiter Dolicanus. Drawing upon inscriptional evidence in a recent study, Anna Collar offered an intriguing analysis of the geographical spread of the cult and of the social class of its devotees, who seemed in this case to have been drawn again from the army, but in this case from the officer corps of the Roman army. The deity was obviously a variant form of the Roman god Jupiter, adapted and blended with a local deity in ancient Dolike, in ancient Dolike on the border of the Syrian desert. Collar wrote, quote, in the century or so between roughly 125 and 230 AD, worship of the North Syrian storm god Jupiter Dolicanus raced through the populations on the northern frontiers of the Roman Empire and the cult trans transmitted westward through networks of Roman army officers. Obviously, as with, Mithraeum, with, uh, as with Mithraism, the cult of Jupiter Dolicanus was also only a male's cult. Now, it is interesting that these, various, these three mystery cults all comprise adaptations of local deities from eastern parts of the empire for successful translocal and empire-wide appropriation. In that rough sense, one can draw a comparison with the early Christian movement. It likewise sprang from an eastern location, Roman Judea in this case, and comprised initially a remarkable and innovative variant in the ancient Jewish tradition, the god of the ancient Jews. 
but went on to success as a distinguishable trans-ethnic and trans-local movement. One obvious difference to a note immediately, however, is in the long-term outcome of these various new religious movements. In the case of all of the so-called mystery cults, they enjoyed various levels of take-up for a while, though scarcely longer than a couple of centuries or so. Indeed, of all of the new, and I've only shown you a few, but of all of the many new religious movements of the Roman era, only Christianity continued to grow and succeed and survives today, and is, one of, and is the one movement, as they say, that remains a living and vibrant world religion. Of course, that success included what is often referred to as the triumph of Christianity against efforts to destroy it, eventuating in its adoption by Constantine as the imperial religion. It was not Constantine, however, who made early Christianity a success. It would be more accurate to say that it was the prior success of Christianity, despite opposition, that made it attractive to Constantine. He was no fool. But there were other distinguishing features of early Christianity as well in the first three centuries, and in the remaining parts of this lecture, I want to highlight several that I discuss at greater length in the new book, Destroyer of the Gods, mentioned earlier. My emphasis on, the, on the early Christian distinctiveness is not particularly apologetic, a particularly apologetic project of trying to big up Christianity. I simply have two aims. First, for the sake of historical knowledge, I simply want to make the point that early Christianity was, in the context in which it first appeared, genuinely distinctive, unusual, even bizarre in the eyes of contemporaries. I intend this is something of a balancing emphasis to some other scholarly work of recent decades that has tended, rightly, to posit similarities between early Christianity and its historical context. My object is not to deny any such similarities, for early Christianity was surely a historical phenomenon of the Roman era, and so we should expect that it reflected some characteristics of that time. But these similarities should not be pressed to the neglect of the very real distinctiveness of early Christianity in that same Roman setting. I urge that an adequate and balanced picture must include a recognition of the features that comprise that distinctiveness as well. My second point, though it plays a much smaller role in the book and in this lecture, is that the features that made early Christianity distinctive in that Roman era have subsequently become, for us, cultural commonplaces at least in those cultures where Christianity has had strong influence. And that is what I meant in the opening sentence of the book in which I refer to it as addressing our cultural amnesia. So let's consider some of these distinctive features of early Christianity. First, early Christian impiety. Let's begin with what many in the Roman era consider to be Christian godlessness. To understand this charge, we have to take account of what piety involved in the Roman era. In the Roman period generally, all gods in principle were real and valid, and they deserved worship, therefore. Even those philosophically minded individuals who debated the nature of the gods, whether they cared about humans and the world, and even whether the gods really existed, nevertheless continued to participate and to encourage, generally, the worship of the gods. And even, it would seem, typically refuse, uh, and, and they, they, they never try to discourage the worship of them or to discourage others in participating in them. Similarly, what modern scholars refer to sometimes as ancient pagan monotheism, curious term, was really a body of philosophical discourse that had little effect on the actual practice of religion in the Roman world. To repeat the point for emphasis, in the Roman world, all gods deserve worship, but you didn't have to work through a checklist to ensure that you uh, ticked them all off. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't have to be afraid that you omitted anybody, but in principle, if the opportunity presented itself, you were expected to participate in the worship of any god. They were all equally valid. It was generally sufficient to worship the gods of your own family, your own city, and your own people. On the other hand, if, for example, you visited another city or land and were invited to take part in the worship of the deities there, you could do so freely without fearing that your own gods would be offended, except for the Jewish god. Also, if you, uh, if you, um, if you were commanded by city authorities or whoever to join in the worship of the deity, such as Roma, as a sign of imperial loyalty, there was no problem in complying. But to refuse to worship the gods when the occasion arose was to act in an unfriendly and even impious manner. 
This was especially acute when it came to the deities linked to your own family, your own city, your own nation. For the worship of these gods was an important way, perhaps the important way, in which you signaled your participation in and your loyalty to those social groups. Likewise, acknowledging the gods identified with the Roman Empire signaled your loyalty and solidarity with it. Even those adherents of the various new voluntary religious movements of the time, the so-called mystery cults that I mentioned earlier, although they became devotees of Isis or Mithras or whoever, also continued to participate in the worship of their traditional gods. You simply added on Isis, not in place of any traditional gods. So becoming a devotee of Isis or Mithras, for example, was, as I say, more of an addition to your religious repertoire, not a replacement for your previous uh, responsibilities. And here is where early Christianity differed. Alone, among the various new religious movements of the Roman era, so far as we know, early Christianity alone expected adherents to abstain from the worship of all deities other than the one they called the true and living God and his son, to cite wording from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. In the discourse reflected in many early Christian texts, all other gods were re referred to as idols, a term that typically designated something as an illusion or phantom. In effect, the gods are treated and referred to by Christians as phonies. That didn't mean a denial of their existence, please note. Indeed, early Christians sometimes emphasized that the pagan gods were real beings, but demonic beings utterly unworthy of worship. For example, consider Paul's exhortation in 1 Corinthians 10, quote, to flee from the worship of idols. And in the same context, his further characterization of the pagan gods as demons. The early Christian concern wasn't particularly to deny the existence of the pagan gods, but to deny them as worthy of worship. In academic terms, this was cultic exclusivity that went against the grain of Roman era religious practice and belief. Indeed, because in the minds of people of that time the reality of the gods is demonstrated by worshiping them, not by signing a statement of faith, but by engaging in worship. So to deny them worship is effectively to deny their existence almost. And so because the Christians refused to engage in the worship of the gods, their refusal to do so could even amount to atheism a charge that in fact is hurled against early Christians. They're accused of being atheists. So I say to people today who say I'm an atheist, I say I'm a better one. I probably don't believe in more gods than you don't believe in. <laughs> if you're going to be a good Christian, you learn, have to learn how to be a good atheist. <laughs> Given the linkage of deities to family, city, and people, early Christian refusal to worship these deities also came over to the wider public as deeply antisocial. So another charge hurled against Christians is that they were called haters of mankind. To cite Tacitus's expression from the Annals. In short, the early Christian stance against worship of the gods was profoundly objectionable to many and generated tensions for Christians in their various family and social associations. And I repeat, it was a unique stance among Roman-era new religious movements. To be sure, however, this early Christian cultic exclusivity simply echoed the stance advocated previously in Roman-era Judaism, the matrix out of which the Jesus movement first appeared. But in the eyes of the pagans of the time, notice please, the Jewish obstinacy about the gods was simply one particularly annoying feature of Jewish ethnicity. Again, religion is associated with people, with nation. Jewish refusal to worship the gods was understood as a feature of their ethnicity. They didn't like it, they thought it was weird, they thought it was annoying, but it featured in their logic. But in the eyes, as they say, in the eyes of uh, pagans of the time, Jewish obstinacy about the gods was simply a feature of their ethnicity. Every nation had its own ways, and in the eyes of Roman pagans, the Jews even more so. But as the Jesus movement began to recruit more and more non-Jews, a.k.a. Gentiles, and began to be seen as a distinguishable religious movement, their refusal to worship the gods generated a distinctive hostility. 
Jews might be allowed their obstinacy, but pagan adherents of early Christianity had no such ancestral or ethnic right, and so their refusal to worship the gods was deemed a much greater offense, a serious social deviance, indeed a potential danger to, posit, to establish religious practice and social cohesion. This brings me to the next distinctive feature of early Christianity. Adherents to early Christianity were expected to take on what we might call, in our language, a new religious identity. For most of us today, the notion of a religious identity distinguishable from our ethnic identity is axiomatic. So as I point out in the book, if you, uh, in Britain or in, in the United States, you have a periodic census and one of the questions will be, what is your ethnicity? And you can put down Hispanic, Black Caribbean, uh, white Anglo-Saxon, whatever, and then there will typically be another question in which you're asked to register your religious affiliation. And you can put down, you know, Hindu, uh, Christian, Protestant, whatever. Uh, in a recent British census, I think about 50,000 people put down Jedi. Um, <laughs> seriously. To most of us today, the notion of a religious identity distinguishable from our ethnic identity is utterly unproblematic, indeed seems natural. Illustrative of this, as I say, you have this sort of double question on a, on, a, on a census. But this actually shows us, again, how far we are from the cultural situation of the Roman era. And I contend also how much our conceptions have been shaped by the influence of Christianity. Indeed, I contend that in early Christianity, we see the first emergence of what we would recognize as a religious identity distinguishable from one's family or ethnic identity. Now, the phrase religious identity is ours, of course, but I submit that the substance of what we mean by that expression first appeared in early Christianity. I mean by that a religious identity distinguishable from your ethnicity. Recall my earlier point that for the most part, gods were tied to your family, your city, and your people. Essentially, your gods were conferred with your birth certificate. And so your religious identity, in our terms, was tied to the social groups by which you were identified. This ethnic linkage of the gods is particularly evident in the process of becoming a Jewish convert or proselyte in the Roman era. A Gentiles who underwent full proselyte conversion are described as renouncing idolatry, but also renouncing their family and their nation and joining the Jewish nation. So when you change your religion fully, you change your nation as well, and a proselyte fits that logic. For proselytes, as I say, religious conversion also involved a change in ethnic identity, the two inseparable. By contrast, pagan converts to early Christianity were expected to remain members of their families and to remain what they were ethnically, such as Greek or Egyptian or Syrian or whatever. But they were to disassociate themselves from all the gods of their families, their nations, and their cities, and to devote themselves solely to the one God and to his Son proclaimed in the Christian gospel. I propose that in this we see the effective disassociation of ethnicity and religious identity, and, that re and, a, and a religious identity as a distinctive feature of early Christianity in the Roman world. And again, something that has now become for us a cultural commonplace. We likely presume that any religion has its scriptures, its sacred texts, that have a, a special place in, as a basis for teaching and also likely a place in corporate worship. But yet again, that assumption is shaped heavily by the influence of Christianity. For example, another distinctive feature of early Christianity was what I refer to as its bookishness. Now, I don't mean that early Christianity consisted simply in the use of books or that it was some kind of scribal cult that sat around copying and nothing else. Early Christianity wasn't a scribal sect such as uh, seems to be reflected in the famous Dead Sea Scroll community at Qumran. But if we weigh up the effective indications of the major place of reading, composition, copying, and dis uh, uh, dissemination and interpretation of texts in early Christianity, its bookishness, I think, is clear. Moreover, if we compare early Christianity with the many other religious options in the Roman era, the religious investment in texts is remarkable. Indeed, with the possible exception, again, of its Jewish matrix, early Christianity is distinctive in this matter. From its Jewish origins, of course, early Christian circles inherited the practice of reading scriptures in the context of corporate worship gatherings, as in the synagogue, so in early Christian ecclesia settings. 
Initially, therefore, the texts designated and treated as scriptures in these circles of the Jesus movement were those that came to form the completed Jewish canon eventually, the, or the so-called Christian Old Testament. So, for example, the exhortation in 1 Timothy 4.13 to, quote, give attention to the public reading must mean the reading of scripture texts in corporate worship, as is reflected in many modern translations and I think agreed typically in commentaries. But we should note that the reading of scripture texts as a component in corporate worship marked off Jewish and Christian practice in the ancient Roman world. That's not a feature of re religious uh, groups and gatherings outside of either Jewish or early Christian circles. Moreover, we should also take account of the impressive production of new texts in early Christianity, some of which acquired also a status as scripture. By common scholarly judgment, the earliest extant Christian writings are the several undisputed letters of the Apostle Paul, which are typically dated as composed somewhere between roughly 50 to 65 AD. Now, Paul wrote these letters with the expectation that they should be read out to the various individual churches gathered together uh, as a congregation, the various churches to which they were sent. As well, from an early point, Paul's letters were circulated then beyond their original recipients, which may well have involved making copies of them, as seems to be reflected, for example, in Colossians 4, 16. Indeed, where he talks about exchange the letter from Colossian Laodicea and so on. Indeed, the earliest reference to Christian texts as scriptures is in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, where Paul's letters are so designated. Um, and there the author is arguing with a bunch of blockheads, which means people who disagreed with him. And, um, and uh, he, uh, he, he refers to them as twisting um, the letters of Paul as they do the other scriptures. So Paul's letters seem to be linked in with scriptures. Interesting, isn't it? Um, he considers their interpretation of Paul's letters, uh, th that is, his interpretation of Paul's letters and their interpretation of Paul's letters are in conflict, but they both agree that Paul's letters are Scripture. So the, the, the view of Paul's letters and Scripture is not confined to one kind of Christianity, but seems to have been shared by various groups that couldn't agree with each other otherwise. Moreover, we should, uh, as I say, take account of the production of new texts. Paul's letters, the earliest ones to achieve the status of Scripture. It is further interesting that the passage refers to a collection of Paul's letters, another interesting activity, as they do, you know, uh, uh, they twist all of Paul's letters. He refers to all of, so he thinks he knows all of Paul's letters. So he has a letter collection of some sort. Is it four? Is it seven? Is it 13? We don't know, but whatever it is, he thinks he has a complete collection by the time of Second Peter, somewhere 70 to 120 A.D. By the mid-2nd century A.D., the four familiar New Testament Gospels likewise appear to have been read in corporate worship in at least some Christian circles, perhaps most. This seems to, to be reflected in Justin Martyr's off-cited off references to the liturgical reading of what he calls the memoirs of the apostles in the first apology. And to gospels, plural, interesting he notes, gospels, plural, written both by, he says, both by apostles and by those who followed them. So you seem to have a plural gospels by apostles and a plurality of gospels by those who followed them. Of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would serve nicely. Indeed, by the early third century, the majority of the writings that make up the New Testament were being copied and read as scripture in various Christian circles. But we know also that there were many other early Christian texts composed in the first three centuries. For example, the author of the Gospel of Luke in the opening words refers to many previous accounts, quote, of the events that have been fulfilled among us, which he says, I've consulted, no longer extant, perhaps beyond, as most of us assume, the Gospel of Mark. The 27 texts that make up the New Testament, all of them composed at various points between roughly 50 and 120 AD, further illustrate something of the textual productivity of early Christian circles. And if we track further down through the mid -thir third century or so, we know of at least 200 texts composed by Christians. These include various other gospels, theological tractates, defenses of Christianity, commentaries on biblical books, hymn collections, and texts of other literary genres. 
Some of these texts survive only partially or in citations or simply in references to them, and it is likely that there were still other texts that are now totally unknown to us. In short, early Christianity was impressively prolific in the composition of texts. I would say exceptionally so among all religious groups of the period. In addition, there were also a remarkable amount of effort and resources put into the copying and distribution of texts in early Christian circles. This process began early. Note Paul's, uh, note Paul's epistle is addressed to the churches of Galatia, likely indicating churches in several Galatian cities. So either multiple copies had to be sent by Paul or else he intended that his letter be sent to one church and then copied and sent on to subsequent churches uh, in the circle. Likewise, the prophet John sent the book of Revelation as an epistle addressed to seven named churches in the Roman province of Asia. And so it would have had to be copied or sent around in the same way. So some arrangement had to be made to ensure that each of the seven churches had a copy. Recall also that reference in 2 Peter 3 to all of Paul's letters suggesting some kind of collection of them, which means they had to be copied in order to be collected. And these epistles circulating amongst Christians who differed, as I said, over how to interpret them. In his letter to the Philippian church, the second century Christian teacher Polycarp expresses his intention to send with it, quote, the letters of Ignatius of Antioch that were sent to us by him together with any others that we have in our possession. This Ignatius wrote to several churches along his captive trek to Rome for martyrdom in the early second century. So it appears that these letters that he sent to the individual churches were in turn copied and then gathered together into a collection of uh, in Ignatius's letters, which Polycarp had at his hand and which he could then copy and send to the Philippian church. In another early Christian text, the Shepherd of Hermas, another second century text, the Roman Christian author, Hermas, claims that he made a copy of a small book that he saw in a vision, which was to be read out to the church in Rome. He then relates another vision in which he is directed to make two copies of this book. One copy was for Clement, a figure in the Roman church, who was then to make copies and send copies of the book out to other churches in various cities. The other copy, he made two copies, one for Clement to copy, and the other copy was made for a woman named Grapti, a woman leader in the church. And yes, there were women leaders in the early church, so if you want to replicate the early church, you've got to have women in leadership or you're a defective church. <laughs> this was made for Grapti, a woman leader in the Roman church, who was to employ it, quote, to instruct the widows and orphans in the church. To judge by extant Christian manuscripts, by the way, the shepherd of Hermas enjoyed wide circulation and popularity. It is the third most frequently attested Christian text in extant manuscripts from the first three centuries. You have John, Matthew, and the Shepherd of Hermas. Those are the three top ones. Got one copy of Mark. To appreciate what was involved in the distribution of Christian text translocally, we must remember that there was no public postal system, and so all written communications, letters, or texts had to be conveyed by direct special arrangements. This meant either payments, for example, to overland traders or ship captains for conveying the text, or sending them by the hand of a trusted courier. Either way, the circulation of text required the outlay of financial resources. And if a Christian courier was engaged, this involved an obvious personal commitment of time and effort. In this light, quote, quoting one of my uh, teachers from earlier years, the extensive and lively interactions between various Christian groups in various parts of the Roman world that included the wide circulation of texts is truly impressive. For example, we have actual comp manuscript copies of Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon in ancient uh, France. Uh, we have actual copies of Irenaeus's Against Heresies, written somewhere around 170, 180 AD, and works by Melito of Sardis at about the same time, found in the Egyptian provincial town of Oxyrhynchus, 120 miles south of Alexandria. And these copies uh, paleographically dated to within perhaps a decade of their, uh, after their composition, as well as various copies of New Testament writings, Old Testament texts, and still other writings. 
The early Christian bookishness is exhibited also in two distinguishing physical and, vi and, and visual features of Christian books. The first feature is the book form. Early Christians clearly adopted the codex as their preferred book form, especially for their scriptural texts. In a time when the book roll, the scroll, was overwhelmingly preferred in the wider culture. I think I have some pictures here. Here you have a uh, pie chart. The blue uh, is, uh, now this is, this is uh, copies, uh, extant copies of manuscripts from the second century. And the blue is the, uh, the percentage of book rolls. So you see it, the book rolls comprise at least 75% of the total material from the second century. Um, the, uh, the percentage of codex is the green. And that amounts to about 5% of the extant manuscripts in the, in the green there. The, the rest of it is um, sheets and fragments. That is, we can't tell. If you confine yourself to just the material that can be identified as either rolls or codexes, codexes amount, uh, rolls amount to about 95% and, uh, and codexes about 5% of the total of extant manuscripts from the second century of all kinds. Early Christians preferred the codex, however, for their book form, especially for the text that they regarded as scripture. Indeed, in the second and third centuries, as I've shown here, the book roll reigned supreme, especially for literary texts, whereas the codex had a much more limited use, especially for so-called subliterary texts, such as astronomical tables, lists of medical recipes, and other workaday items. Indicative of this, here you have an example of a book roll, by the way, to show us how it's put together. You take consecutive sheets of leather or of papyrus, and as you can see, the, I hope you can see the seams running down where they're joined together. You lay it out, and then you put these tall, narrow columns, and you can make the scroll as large as you need it. Here's a, the famous St. Mark's Isaiah scroll made on leather. You have a replica of it in the library, which you can examine later tonight if you want. Here you have an example of a codex being used, a, a pagan um, um, relief. And this is a tax accounting where people are coming by to pay their taxes, and so the tax bills are being recorded in a codex. So you see what I mean by sort of subliterary uses of the codex. It was not considered appropriate mainly for literary texts. Here's a, a famous scene in which you have this famous couple uh, from uh, Herculaneum, uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, uh, they are quite, you'll notice, uh, quite, quite eager to show you that they are literate. So. Uh, uh, the man is holding a roll, and the woman is holding a, uh, a little uh, wax, set of wax tablets, sort of the predecessor of the codex, uh, two wax tablets that are held together with a thong, and she has a stylus looking very pensively. It's interesting, isn't it? Both the man and the woman are literate and can both read and write. Um, and, and by the way, we think that they were sort of a, 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 a couple who, who operated a, a bakery. So they weren't high-class people. They were sort of mercantile-class people. And yet both of them can read and write, but they're quite important to say, you, I want you to know that I can read and write. So they got, this is something prepared for, to, for remembering them by after their death. By the way, can you also see the gendering of literacy here? The man is holding a rolled-up roll, which is for literary purposes, philosophical tractates, things like that. The woman has a workaday item on which she, in, in, on, on which she writes uh, shopping lists, tasks for the servants, things like that. So literature is the man's, uh, is, is seen as the, as the male uh, uh, enclave, and the woman is literate, but her job is to be functionally literate in other ways. Um, and, and so it's interesting for early Christians to have adopted the codex is very interesting when in one sense it's actually associated more with subliterary or even <laughs> feminine things, and the early Christians prefer the codex as their, for their most highly prized text. It's what I would call a bit of a countercultural move. Indicative of this among all manuscripts of literary texts, as I've shown going back a bit to the second century in the Leuven database of ancient books, oops, um, such as you see here, and this is where I take it from, if you, by the, the Leuven, L-E-U-V-E-N, Leuven database of ancient books, a fascinating site. You can go there and search for all of their manuscripts individually, and it will prepare these pie charts for you and graph, craft charts for you, century by century, all sorts of things. Here you see about 5% of the total for the second century uh, are codexes, and among third century manuscripts, about 15% of the total are codexes. But among Christian literary manuscripts of the same period, at least 75% 
our uh, codexes. And if we confine our attention to those writings that Christians treated as scripture, that is, Old Testament writings and those that became part of the New Testament, about 95% of Christian copies from the second and third century are codexes. Christians of the time cannot have been ignorant that they were differing in this. Here you see how a codex is put together. You take, on the left, you have folded sheets of writing material. You fold them and then you stitch them down the middle and you have a simple codex of 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, um, even, a, a, even 100 pages or more. And then the other on the right, you see you take uh, groups of three or four or five folded sheets, stitch them together, and then stack them on top of one another and stitch them together, and you have a book made up of various um, uh, what we call choirs. And of course, this is the way we construct proper books to this day. Christians cannot have been ignorant that they were differing in their preference from the wider culture. Their preference for the codex must, I think, have been deliberate. Moreover, that preference is clear in our earliest evidence of Christian books, and so likely must have, been, must have commenced by the early second century and perhaps even earlier. Scholars have proposed various reasons for this preference, some urging some supposedly practical advantage, but all such notions seem to me counterintuitive. Are we to presume that among all the peoples of that time, only Christians perceived the supposedly obvious superiority of the Codex? I revere my Christian ancestors, but that somehow seems a bit counterintuitive. Everybody else was stupid about the issue, and only Christians bright enough to see the obvious superiority of the Codex. It's obvious only because we are used to a leaf book, and a role is unfamiliar to us. But for people who were familiar with the role, as the ancients were, they thought it was obviously superior for literary text. The respected, I'm not alone in that opinion, for what it's worth, the respected papyrologist William Johnson has rightly referred to the claims that Christians preferred the codex for this or that supposed practical advantage as, in his word, all red herrings. Instead, whatever may have been the original impetus, it seems much more cogent that early Christians preferred the codex as a deliberately distinctive move, setting their books apart, particularly their scriptural books, in physical form. This commitment to the codex then required Christians to experiment with various ways of constructing them because people didn't tend to use the codex for literary texts. So if you're going to use it for such an ambitious purpose, you're actually taking a fairly simple instrument and making it serve a much grander purpose. It's like taking a Volkswagen Beetle and trying to make a stretch limo out of it or a heavy goods vehicle out of it. It required Christians to experiment with various means of constructing codices adequate for such large bodies of text, such as a fourfold gospels or the Pauline letter collections. Indeed, to judge by the extant manuscripts of the late second and third century, and here's, by the way, a page of one of these codexes, the so-called P75, which is remnants of the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John, commonly dated to the early third century, uh, one leaf of it. Indeed, to judge by the extant manuscripts of the late second and third centuries, Christians appear to have been at the leading edge of such experimentation. Finally, settling on the use of multiple gatherings, they say sort of taking three, four, five sheets which form a gathering, stitching it together and making the codex of multiple gatherings or choirs, ultimately settling on that, but they used actually at least three different methods of codex construction, which time prevents me from talking about at this moment, but if you um, want to buy a book, I would perhaps to say more about it. This, of course, <laughs> this is, of course, what became the standard method, as I said, of constructing books of choir, still used in our modern leaf book. The other key physical or visual feature of early Christian books are the copyist devices referred to by scholars today as the nomina sacra, Latin term which means basically sacred names. These are unique abbreviated forms of key terms here you have the four Greek words down the left side, the Greek words for Jesus, Christ, God, and Lord. And then off to the right, you have typical abbreviated uh, or nomina sacra forms. It involved using a, comp uh, a compacted form, typically first letter, last letter of the word with this puzzling uh, horizontal stroke written over the abbreviation. 
unique abbreviated forms of key words in early Christian discourse with this distinctive horizontal stroke written over the abbreviation. The words most commonly given this treatment are the ones displayed here, and they're probably the earliest words so treated. The Greek words for God, Theos, Lord, Kyrios, Christ, Christos, and the name Jesus, Jesus. That key terms designating God and Jesus are both given the same treatment is an interesting expression of what I refer to as the dyadic shape of early Christian devotional belief and practice. Jesus included with God in a comparable manner. But my point here is that in the eyes of most scholars who have considered the matter, it's not uh, universally agreed, but in scholarship nothing is, but most of the scholars who have considered the matter, the nomina sacra collectively represent expressions of early Christian piety, and in particular, visual expressions of early Christian piety. Early Christianity appropriated the codex as its preferred book form and developed it, but it appears that the nomina sacra comprise an early Christian innovation, a distinctive Christian copyist practice that, among other things, marked Christian texts visually. Certainly, among papyrologists, if they find a mere fragment of a text that they cannot identify, but if it's uh, got nomina sacra forms on it, unquestionably they treat it as whatever we, we don't know what it is, well, whatever it is, it's a Christian text. It's got nomina sacra. Here's, by the way, an example of another uh, papyrus, a uh, uh, copy of the Gospel of John from the third century, P66, and what you have here I've circled um, uh, nomina sacra forms up at the top. I have usually reading this up at the top. I think that's uh, Yoda Sigma, uh, the abbreviation for Jesus, and down in the red one in the lower right-hand corner as well is uh, Jesus, and then um, uh, the uh, purple one there, uh, purple signal is around an abbreviated form of Kyrios, and then down below that the yellow one is an abbreviated form of the word uh, Pneumati, the word for spirit, uh, where it's referring to the Holy Spirit there. Finally, early Christianity was marked by a distinctive emphasis on proper behavior. We may think today that religion consists of a lot of do's and don'ts, and some people say, I don't like religion because it's all about do's and don'ts. That's another modern notion inappropriate in the Roman world. For the worship of the gods primarily involved sacrifice and associated cultic activities and had only a limited impact on your daily life, your ethics. If you wanted to consider how to live your life, you turned to philosophy in the Roman world, not religion. But again, reflecting its Jewish origins, early Christianity typically promoted a particular way of life with strong behavioral requirements. In the book, I illustrate this in several matters. One of these is the Roman practice of exposing or discarding unwanted infants after birth. This was legal and appears to have been practiced widely without serious qualms or hesitation, as illustrated by an oft-noted letter from a certain Hilarion to his wife, Alice, written in about 1 BC. After greeting his wife and other relatives, Hilarion asks her to, quote, take care of the little one, their child apparently, and promises to send money as soon as he is paid. Alice is expecting, it appears, another child, and Hilarion then instructs her, if it is a boy, let it be. If it is a girl, cast it out. But then, after what will seem this callous order, he expresses his unaltered affection for her. How can I forget you, he writes. I beg you then not to be anxious. Now, Hilarion was obviously not a monster. He was capable of human feelings. That's my point. It wasn't monsters who threw away their kids in the Roman world. It was everyday, nice, caring, related people. The practice of discarding infants was so widespread and accepted by pe that people capable of tender feelings felt little reluctance about it. Among with Judaism, however, early Christianity utterly rejected the practice. As well, early Christianity rejected another widespread practice, pederasty, sex with small children. And by the way, we have indications of sex with children as young as two and three years of age. This practice, too, was common, even cultivated, especially amongst the cultured classes. Most often, this abuse involved, of course, slave children, both male and female. The early Christian condemnation of the practice, by the way, is exhibited distinctively in what appears to be the distinctive Christian terms used to designate it. Instead of the Greek words pederastia, which means child love or boy love, or pederasteo, 
to love or have sex with boys or children, and the, the person who does it as a pederastes, a boy lover or child lover, instead of these terms, early Christians invented the term pedophthoreo, uh, pedophthoreo which means to abuse or corrupt children. And pedophthoros, instead of pederastes, they referred to the person who did this as a pedophthoros, translated roughly, one who sexually abuses children. More generally, early Christianity forbade sexual relations outside of marriage. Of course, adultery, sex with a married woman, was prohibited by everybody, was against the law, frowned upon in the wider culture. But in addition, Christian teaching condemned practices commonly accepted in the Roman world, including particularly sex with prostitutes or courtesans, and those who were typically slaves often provided for sexual pleasures at banquets for males. In doing so, early Christianity essentially laid upon male adherents the same sort of standards of sexual behavior widely expected in the, in the common culture of virtuous wives. The Christian distinctive was to erase the double standard requiring males to practice the same chastity as everybody expected proper women, to man, married women to practice. For early Christianity, what was good for the goose was good for the gander also. Time prevents me from taking this discussion further here. One final observation, however. There are some similarities often noted between early Christian behavioral requirements and the teachings of some Roman-era philosophical figures such as Musonius Rufus. True, if we only consider the content of the teachings. But the off-sided Stoic philosophers, in fact, had little effect on the morals and behavior of any beyond the small circle of their dedicated students. Sort of like becoming a graduate student. You have to spend two or three years to learn how to bend your mind to live that way. Early Christianity, however, laid these strict, same strict behavioral requirements upon all of its adherents and from the point of baptism onward. In the matter of behavioral teaching, when early, uh, when early Christianity is assessed again, it seems to me it is a very distinctive social project. Early Christianity, so to speak, in the words of those great philosophers of the 60s and 70s, the Doobie Brothers, early Christianity took it to the street. <laughs> the differences between early Christianity and its Roman era setting are such that the respected ancient historian Edwin Judge, a friend and a great guy at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, insisted to me firmly in writing that it is misleading to refer to early Christianity as a religion. When I sent him some early chapters, he wrote back, you must not call early Christianity a religion. It doesn't fit any of the criteria of religion in the Roman world. For Judge, it would, more, it would be more accurate to say that early Christianity was a philosophy. Now, I take his point. In at least its first forms, early Christianity had no temples, no shrines, no altars, no sacrifices, no images, or priesthood. Those are the basic requirements of a religion in the Roman world. Christianity had none of them. I would prefer myself, however, to say that early Christianity was a distinctive kind of religion, a distinctive kind of religious movement. But whatever your choice of words, it was distinctive. In the eyes of critics, it was superstition, unacceptable religion bizarre, even repellent, and sufficiently dangerous to justify strenuous efforts occasionally to falsify it and eventually attempts to destroy it by state pogrom. But early Christianity survived and to be sure also adapted and evolved, for better or for worse. More to the point here, a number of features that made early Christianity distinctive in the Roman Empire, I repeat, have become for us cultural commonplaces. Early Christianity helped to destroy one world and created another. Thank you.